How many of you guys know that America, for many years, has been on a downward spiral slope? And um, I remember my father and I went to Louisiana one time and just to preach a revival. And as we were traveling through Texas to get to Louisiana, my dad would would point out all the what used to be the dry counties. My dad would tell me, hey, you couldn't drink liquor here. You couldn't buy liquor here. You would have to moonshine. And dad would tell me these things. And he would just show me where he would live. And, and he pointed out that one, one time America had a conviction that drinking alcohol was wrong. And that in individual states, you would find counties that were dry. And you would have to drive and to get your alcohol if that's what you wanted. My dad used to tell me many times that America used to have a conviction where you would find that people wouldn't do certain things. It was unheard of to find school shootings. Would you agree with me back in the day? It was unheard of for, I mean, now you would, you would feel unsafe to go to school today. You would feel unsafe to go to the theaters. You would feel unsafe to go to the malls. But you and I this morning, as we are here in the building of the church, we would feel safe. But we know that just recently, even wickedness have found itself inside the church. That at times, people don't even feel safe within their own church. And what we have found out is that America has been is becoming wicked. The reality is the world is becoming more wicked as we see it day after day after day. There are morals that are being let go. There are things that are happening that you would have never thought would have happened 20, 10 years ago. There's things. And listen, I love the internet. I love the internet. I, there's a lot of technology that I think is great. I love my iPhone. I love the technology that has been given to you and I, but could you agree with me this morning that the internet and the iPhone and other technology has been a tool for the devil to use within our own America? Listen, I'm just going to give you a little piece of information to try to build some validation how America is being ruined from the inside out. Listen, you may know this or may not. I'm looking around to make sure I, I'm not saying anything that's inappropriate to young ears. But did you know that because of the internet, pornography has been given, is easily accessed now. Did you realize it's destroying our kids? Do you realize it's destroying our marriages? Do you realize it's destroying America? From the inside out, we don't need another World War II, three. We have it right now inside of America. We're destroying America from inside. And America is becoming more wicked. I want you to read with me if you don't mind. I'm just going to give you a scripture reference. Matthew chapter 24 verse 37 says this. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Listen to the scripture once again. Found in Matthew chapter 24 verse 37. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of of man. Has Jesus returned? The answer is no. He hasn't returned yet. So what we realize today is that America is not as wicked as it was in the days of Noah. Just ponder on that just for a moment and if that doesn't make you maybe shake in your skin just for a moment for Noah and his family, but the Bible says that when Jesus comes, it will be as though America, the world, society, will look like it did in Noah's day. So the fact is, is that Noah's day is still more wicked than the day in which you and I are living in. And to you and I, that is overwhelming. It may not be to you, but to me it's overwhelming to think that Noah lived in a world in which you and I are living, but more wicked. And still Noah pleased God. And still in the, in the midst of wickedness, Noah was able to keep faith that was pleasing to God Almighty. That God would look down and he was pleased with Noah. Because Noah walked with God. Even in the midst of a wicked world. But see, I, I have the opportunity to travel the state and meet with teenagers who tell me these statements. Listen, you don't understand where I'm coming from. You don't understand the temptation. You don't know my school. You don't know my world that I live in. You're way too old to understand, Brother Jerry. But what I realize is that even you want to compare me being old to the world that we're living in, Noah was able to live in a world more wicked in which you and I are living in today. What was it? What was it that, 
that enabled Noah to live such a life that when God looked down to earth, his stomach turned and he was sick. And the, the Bible tells us that God repented for creating you and I. What was it? What did Noah have? What enabled Noah to live such a life that was pleasing to God in a world wicked, more wicked than what you and I are living in today? Did you know that June 26th, uh, 2015, you understand the Supreme Court, five to four, has now made every state to give the rights to gay couples to marry. Listen, our world is becoming more wicked every day as those are lo losing conviction. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to talk on this thought because when I mentioned Noah's day and how wicked it was and how did Noah, what enabled Noah, I want to look at this. It's called Noah's kind of faith. I believe if you and I are going to be able to live and stand within the world that we're living with conviction, we must have that Noah's kind of faith. Because I believe that Noah's faith is what enabled him to stand when no one else was standing, to live for God when no one else was living for God, to serve God when no one else was willing to serve God, and to build an ark when no one was willing to build an ark. Amen. It was his faith that stood out among everything Else. And you and I in 2015, we must have that Noah's kind of faith. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 with me this morning. To be able to look at Noah's faith, we must first define faith. What is faith? And then we'll begin to define what Noah's faith looked like. To be able to say this is what will enable you and I in 2015 to live a godly life. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. We need to underline that, because that second verse tells us that faith works. Amen. Listen, that second verse in chapter 11 tells us that faith really does work. Verse 2 says, for by it the elders obtain a good testimony. <clears throat> Can I tell you tonight that your faith will speak for itself? Can I tell you this morning, if you just grab a hold of this faith thing, your faith will speak for, your, for itself. Verse 3 goes on to say this, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Verse 4, By faith, the scoop down is uh, verse 6, I'm sorry. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Verse 7 is where we bring our text from. By faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Would you bow your heads in a prayer this morning? Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. God, I thank you for two weeks of amazing camps which Seminole, Oklahoma, Temple of Praise brought their students to. To be encouraged for them to rise up and to be the generation 24-6, a generation who truly seeks you with one desire, Father, and that you to be Lord of their life. God, I pray that this morning as we begin to look back at the world and how over many, many years America has been dying from the inside out. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll move and help us to understand this morning that what will enable us to stand and to be righteous and, and to be godly before you, Father, and as you look down and say, this is my child whom I'm well pleased, God, let it be known today that it's going to be by Noah's kind of faith. Amen. Noah's kind of faith, Father. And God, we give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we all say Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. Four times in God's word, you may know this already, four times in God's word, we see this phrase, The just or the righteous shall live by faith. Four times through, the God, for, through God's word we find this phrase, God, for the just or the righteous shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. A lot of those you could quote yourself. 
So when we see these things throughout God's word, you know, this faith thing is very important. This faith thing is kind of important for you and I as believers. So if you don't mind this morning, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into um, faith and explain it so we can understand what faith that Noah had. You see, when we look at faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and I'm not, going to, I'm not here to uh, discuss with you or to argue with you or even to, um, I'm just here to give a point. Theology is not my strong point, but I just want you to look at verse 1 and and I perhaps, I'm going to read this in the New King James Version, then I'm going to read it in NLT. And then I'm going to give a, a thought here, if you don't mind. New King James Version says about Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The New Living Translation says it like this, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot See, maybe this morning, if you don't mind, not to argue with you or debate on this subject, but maybe this morning, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is really not a definition of what faith is. Maybe it is a definition of what faith does. Listen to for a moment. I've heard it all my life that this is a definition of faith, but maybe just for a moment, if you could just branch out with me and think outside your box, can you just think for a moment, maybe this definition is what faith does, Instead of what faith is. For instance, maybe when we begin to really believe. See, faith is believing that something is true. That's simple. That's the definition of faith. Faith is believing that something is true. And then faith causes you to commit your lives to it. That's what faith is. For us as Christians, faith means believing in God. And in what Christ has done for us to make salvation possible. And then committing our lives to Christ. That's what faith is. And then when you really place your faith in Christ, all of a sudden what it does is it begins to produce confidence. You, you're not understanding me this morning. When you really place your faith in Christ, what you're doing is all of a sudden your faith begins to produce confidence that what you hope for will actually happen. And it will give you assurance about the things you cannot see. It produces that within you. And you walk around very confident and boldly knowing that even though you cannot see it, you know that your God in which you're serving will bring it about. That's what, that's what faith does. It produces confidence within you. It produces assurance within you. And I'm so thankful that I placed my faith not in man because they let me down. But I place my faith in God who will not let me down, who will never forsake me. I'm thankful today that it produces confidence Amen. and assurance within me. Right. You see, when we place our faith in God to, or make the decision to trust God, our faith produces confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about the things we cannot see. Faith says this, it says, although I lost my job, God will provide. Amen. Because all of a sudden it begins to produce this confidence and this assurance in the God who's never let us down. You see, faith says this. Chapter 11. Excuse me, I lost my place. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us names of men and women whose faith propelled them to do great things for God. And among those names was Noah. Now listen, I hope that someday your name will be, it'll never be written down in the, in the Bible. I understand that. But maybe, just maybe, it will be passed down from generation to generation. Maybe your children will say to their children, my father lived by faith. Maybe, maybe your children will say to their grandchildren, my mother lived by faith. When difficult, difficult times came, my mother and father stood upon the word of God and the God that they served never let them down. And they will be passed out from generation to generation knowing that your faith was placed in God and produced the confidence and assurance knowing that everything was going to be alright. No matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, no matter the difficulties, no matter who was coming against you, you knew that the God that you served was going to provide and protect and bring you through. Amen. That's the God that you serve. And maybe your name will be passed down. Your children will use that. It may never, it will never be written down in the Bible, but it will be passed down from generation to generation. 
If we were truthful this morning, the reality is every one of you and I, we all need a little bit more faith. You see, listen, you, we all, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're a weak Christian. I'm saying even I today behind this pulpit need more faith. Amen. There are things that we are facing that I just need a little bit more faith in. Faith that begins to really produce this confidence and this assurance. And the truth is we need this noble kind of faith. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6 and we begin to dig into what Noah's, we explain what faith is, but let's look at Noah's kind of faith. What, what kind of faith, and we begin to strive faith, what kind of faith did Noah have that enabled him to live in a world in which he lived in? Genesis chapter 6, this morning, I want you to look at this as I turn there. Genesis chapter 6, looking at verses 5. Take me a while. Genesis chapter 5. You guys have already beat me there. Chapter 5. Look at that. Chapter 6. Sorry. Verse 5. And it says this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I believe this morning that we can look around the world today and see the same thing. The hearts of men are evil continually. Verse 6, And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Sorry, genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in the generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth, was so, was off, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has become before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them uh, with the earth. And verse, verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Look at verse 22 with me. Stay in that same chapter. And I want to look what, what happened. Verse 20 says, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. I'll look at three thoughts this morning, if you don't mind, about Noah's kind of faith that I hope will um, encourage you this morning, but also will help you to understand that you have to have this faith and kind of measure, compare your faith to what Noah's faith is and then gives you a starting point of what you could do to get to that Noah's kind of faith. The first point this morning is simply faith that is obedient. When you look at Noah's life and you look at the story for a moment, verse 22 says this. It says, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So we find that Noah was obedient. When you look at faith, and this is what it says. Faith that says, God, I'm not sure, but I will. Let me just make sure you understand. Noah was not a boat builder. Noah didn't have a clue. It never rained before. He did not know anything about rain. He's never seen a boat before. He'd never been on a cruise ship. And eat all you can eat cruise ships. He'd never been on one of those carnivals and all those things. But faith that is obedient. We find that Noah was a just man. And what's amazing is when God came to Noah and he said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. Noah said, God, I'll do what you asked me to do. If there's ever been a time we need a generation of people that will rise up and say, God, my faith is going to be obedient to you. I'm going to place my faith in you, but I'm also going to be obedient to you. And I'm going to do what you told me to do without question. God, I will do what you've asked me to do because you are sovereign. You are God. And you've asked us to do this. And God, I will do what you told me to do. Listen, I'm tired of weak Christians, if you don't mind. 
We need some strong Christians that say, God, I might not know what you're asking me to do, but I'll still do it. Amen. God, I will live according to what you've asked me to do. I will read my Bible and I'll let your Bible, God, change my life. Amen. Because I'll be obedient to it. Yeah, right. Amen. The Bible tells us not to just be a hearers talking of the word, but to be a doers of the word. Yeah. That means obedient to what God says. I tell you, Noah was obedient. His faith was obedient. God, I'll build the ark. God, I'll build the ark. I don't know what I'm doing, but God, I'll build the ark. God's asking some of you to step out in faith and just do what He's asked you to do. You don't need, you don't need to know how. God will teach you how. You don't need to know why. God will teach you why. Just do what He's asked you to do this morning. Have that Noah kind of faith that says, I will be obedient to you, God, because you are God. Amen. God, listen, I want you to just grasp this for this, this minute, this, in this minute for this moment, whatever I'm trying to say this morning. Noah was the only one on the earth at the time that was pleasing God. There's something about Noah's kind of faith. <clears throat> It was obedient. It was obedient. John chapter 14 verse 15 says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, then keep my commandments. If you love me, obey me. So many times throughout the word of God we hear this. Him who has an ear, let him hear. Him that has an ear, let him hear. That's because God has something very important for his people to hear. But more than that, he wanted them to obey his word. We find a story in the Bible where we find the scripture that says faith that, that is better to, um, obedience is better than sacrifice. You may know this story, may not know this story. We find a, a scripture in, the, in First Kings or Second Kings, I'm not sure where it's at. I think it's First Kings. We find the story where um, uh, simply it states that obedience is better than sacrifice. And when I was growing up, it was really funny because in Sunday school, my Sunday school teacher would tell me, hey, listen, you want to obey God or God's going to do something horrible in your life. Mm. Because the obedience is better than sacrifice. You know, you don't want to sacrifice your new car. You don't want to sacrifice, sacrifice your college career. You don't want to sacrifice your family. And she brought it across as though God was going to do something horrible in my life if I didn't obey him. That is not what that means. <laughs> That is not what that means at all. What God is just simply trying to get across to you and I is that God knows that there's second chances, there's third chances, and there's fourth chances, and God gives us plenty of chances. Amen. But God wants you to obey. Amen. That's a whole lot better than asking God for forgiveness. Amen. You didn't understand me. God gives us chances. Amen. Thank God for mercy and grace. Amen. But what pleases God the most is when you just simply obey Him. That's what it is. And that faith all of a sudden begins to produce this confidence and this assurance that everything's going to be all right. I want you to look at the second point this morning. This next two I want to hang out, if you don't mind, and just camp out here because I think they're very important. Not that the first one wasn't, but faith that is teachable. You know what I've realized is that we're in a limited in a world of people who are very intelligent. And they don't need to be taught anymore. It's almost as though they have arrived. You, I've been in church for 15 years, 20 years. I don't need to be teachable anymore. I've read my Bible through one time. And I'm 50 years old. Wow. Great job. Really? What I'm saying is now we have come to a point where people are so knowledgeable that they don't need to be taught anymore. God still looks at us and desires for us to be teachable. Not by just by the pastor, not by your Sunday school teachers, but by him. God wants to be able to teach you. The Bible says that Jesus had this, this encounter with his disciples. He says, listen, guys, I got a goal because the guy that's coming next is more important than I am. You're going to do greater things. He's going to teach you and he's going to guide you and he's going to direct you. I must go so God can send his promise to you. God wants you to be able to be yielded to His Spirit and to be able to be teachable. Right. See, teachable faith says this. It says faith that, that says, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I will learn. Amen. 
Faith says, I don't know what I'm doing. Again, we'll go back to Noah. Noah wasn't a builder. A boat builder, he didn't have a clue how to build an ark. He probably didn't know what pitch was until God began to teach him what pitch was. There's a lot of things that Noah didn't know, but all of a sudden he began to let his spirit be yielded to God and say, God, teach me. Listen, we need to be taught by God's spirit. We need another generation right here at Temple of Praise in Seminole, Oklahoma as a church and as individuals that will let yourselves be led by the Spirit of God and be teachable. Amen. Have a teachable spirit because when you look at God's Word, James brings this out. Some of you, and myself included at times, I've looked at God's Word and God is trying to teach me something and I close it real quick and say, oh, God, listen, I got that under control. God, I don't need I don't need to change that area of my life. I got that figured out. I know how to live with that in my life. I know how to live with bitterness. I got it all conquered. I know how to live with enviness. I've got that conquered. I've lived through it so long. I know how to live with pain and hurt and anger toward men and people. I've lived with it so long. I know how to adapt to it. So I've I've worked with it. And God's saying, no, I want to teach you how to let go of that. I want you to see deliverance in your life. I want you to let go of the habits and the addictions. But when you open God's word and God is trying to teach you something, you close it because you don't want to hear. And we got to have some people that will have Noah's kind of faith that says my faith will be teachable. I place my faith in God and now I'm going to allow God to teach me what it means to walk with Him, to live for Him, and to serve Him. God, I need you to teach me. Listen, I, I'm telling you, I don't know what I would do without God's Spirit teaching me every day of my life. We must have that kind of a walk in relationship with God where we stay humble before Him. We stay teachable, moldable. Listen, it's kind of like Jeremiah. You've read the story where Jeremiah has been led by God down to the potter's house. And he sees his potter, he's molding and shaping this clay. And God wants you to be like that. He wants you to be able to be molded and shaped to His likeness. Not yours, but His likeness. And sometimes you and I, when we close our Bible, what we're trying to do is to keep God from molding us into His likeness. We want to keep looking like the way we look. Because when God begins to work on us, how many of you guys would agree with me that sometimes it brings um, the feeling of being uncomfortable? <laughs> Uneasy. It's not easy sometimes to break habits. It's not easy sometimes to get over bitterness. It's not easy sometimes forgiving. I know that. I became a Christian at the age of 13. There's something that happened to me when I was five years old by my cousin that I held a lot of pain, a lot of anger toward him. It wasn't until I was 17 years old that I actually forgave him of what he did. Now listen, I was a Christian at the age of 13, but I really didn't have that Noah's kind of faith because I wasn't teachable. God was telling me over and over, you got to forgive, you got to forgive. How, if you don't forgive your brother, how do you really love me? And at the age of 17, I wrote a letter to forgive this man. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you the experience and the relief because I finally obeyed God. I was so teachable. I said, God, please teach me. I want to know more of you. And before I could go to any other level in God, I had to forgive this man. Some of you guys, can I just be honest with you? You're wanting more faith before you can ever get to the next level of faith. You're going to have to do what God's telling you to do. You're going to have to be obedient, but you're going to have to be teachable. <clears throat> Listen, I'm just being honest this morning. The only reason why I'm here is because your pastor knows that I love you. He wouldn't let anybody in his pulpit that he didn't know that would care for you and take good care of you. So I'm, just, I'm not trying to be the mean guy. I'm just simply saying that you've got to be teachable. Amen. You've got to let God and through his word to teach you. Because when you look at it, it is like a mirror, like James says. And it shows you the things that are good and the things that are bad in your life that needs to be changed. If there's ever been a time that we need to be have teachable faith is now. God, teach me. Teach me your things so that I can glorify you. Amen. Amen. It's all about glorifying God. I want you to look at Titus for a moment. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. 
It's going to go up on the screen. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared to all men. And let me read it from the New King James Version. It says something just a little bit different. So it'll drive my point home if you don't mind. It says this in Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. I apologize. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Listen to what's being said. His grace will teach us, His Spirit will teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present, present time, present world. Even though it's wicked. Even though it's sometimes it's hard for you and, you and I as mothers and fathers to send our kids to school. Because we're worried about them. Sometimes it's hard for us to send them to camp because we're worried about them. But if we'll be teachable, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. We can only do this if we deny what? We die, deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We can never, never live soberly, righteous, or godly if we still, can, still hold on to the uh, ungodliness and the worldly lust in our life. We must be taught by God to let go of those things. Would you agree with me? Yes. And give the Lord a hand clap praise this morning when you do that. You can give him a high five because I'm not even close to being done, so I apologize. The third thing that I want to look at this morning is faith that is persistent. When I look at Noah's life, I see these three things. I see that he's obedient. I see that he's teachable. I mean, he had to work on that boat for years. Some commentary says that he worked for 55 to 75 years on that boat. And each day was a day of teaching. Each day was a day of learning. You and I, you may be 35, you may be 37, you may be 40, you may be 60, you may be in any of those ages from 1 to 110. But each day is something that you're learning. You see, where the Bible says that when we give our lives to Christ, we are new creatures. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. It's new. So every day we have to learn how to live for God. Each day we have to learn what is pleasing to God and what's not pleasing to God. And we take those things that are pleasing and we multiply them. We take those things that are not pleasing to God and we get them out of our life. Each day is new. We be teachable. Faith that is persistent. Faith that says this. God, no matter how long or how difficult it is, I will hold true to you. I want you to think about that just for a moment because, again, we're living in a world that is wicked. I'm not taking that away. It is wicked. I mean, just look at the news. Look what's happened recently in all these different states. Look at the shooting in a church building. Bible study night. I mean, look, look, look how wicked our world is. And I'm asking you to have faith that is persistent. Faith like Noah that says, no matter how wicked it is, I'll still live for God. I'll still walk with God. Faith that is persistent. It simply says, no matter how long or how difficult it is, I will stay true to you. It's persistent means to continually, firmly, in a course of action, in spite of difficulty or opposition. It means to be tenacious. It means to be determined. It means to be resolute. It means to be patient. Wow. We all deal with that one, don't we? It's difficult for it to be patient. It means to be relentless. It means to be unrelenting. We find that persistent means a lot to us. It means to continue to exist or to endure over a period of time. No matter how long, how difficult it's going to be, God, I will stay true to you. I will stay faithful to you. And I'll still serve you, God. You may know this or not, but it was when God looked at Noah and said he was going to destroy the earth, and he said it was going to rain from that point until the time that it rained it was 120 years 120 years and I mentioned this a minute ago it took him 55 to 75 years to build the ark let me just take you back for a moment <laughs> we rewind all the way back to Noah's time as he's building the ark can you just imagine how he's being mocked can you just imagine what he was going through could you imagine what his children were going through there's your dad again <laughs> Noah building that ark your dad's an idiot. It wasn't just affecting Noah. It was affecting his family. Hey, there's your 
your husband know it? Man, what an idiot. He said he heard from God and it's going to rain. We don't even know what rain is. And all of a sudden, Noah's being mocked. All of a sudden, what Noah is facing, you and I have not even came near to face yet, perhaps. I mean, has anybody really attacked your family because of your faith? Some of you on your job sites might have been attacked. Some of you on your job sites and your workplace or occupation, your school, surely someone may have made fun of you a little bit, but nothing like Noah for, for 120 years. The difficulty, the task that was laid in front of him, that he was obedient to, that he was teachable, and now he was learning to be the persistent, to continue to stay focused on the task of building the ark, even though he hasn't seen any rain. Although he hasn't seen any kind of a cloud or a promise that it was going to rain, he stayed persistent on his focus on building what God told him to build. He stayed teachable and obedient while he built the ark. Noah's kind of faith, a faith that is persistent. You and I get a little hangnail and worry to throw it in town. God doesn't answer our first prayer like we like Him to answer it. And all of a sudden, we don't think God exists. We're talking about 120 years when God said it would rain and never sprinkled. It didn't rain like cats and dogs until it was ready. And you and I, are we're not persistent any longer. We're not willing to fight any longer. We're not like David, who David says, he comes to this battle and his brothers mock him. He says, is there not a cause? Some of you have lost your cause to fight. Amen. <clears throat> Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Noah's kind of faith that says, I know is producing this confidence that although it's lingering, although we're waiting on God to bring the rain, I know it will rain. Why? Because my faith produces confidence and assurance that what I'm hoping for won't come to pass. I'm building the ark because he said it would rain. I'm standing firm on God's word because he told me my body will be healed. I'm standing firm because God said my family will be saved. That my mother will come to know Christ. And although I don't see any changes in my mama or my daddy's attitude or their desire to serve God, I know it will come to pass. Why? Because every day faith grows within me. Every day my faith produces this confidence that know that it is going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass. I don't know what you're holding out for. Listen, we're all going to see Jesus someday if we stay true to Him. Amen? Amen. But during our wait, we got to be persistent. Got to stay true to God. We got to have that kind of faith. Amen. Noah's kind of faith. Look here with me, if you don't mind, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 8. I hope I got it right this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. It says this. That's not it. Forget it. Put that off the screen quickly. Give me a second. I'll find it real quickly. I mean, you guys love your iPhones. 2 Corinthians, I apologize. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I knew it. I knew I was right. Thank goodness to my concordance on my phone. Let's look at verse 7. 7, 8, and 9. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. First Corinthians chapter 2, you don't have to go there. Verse 5, our faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. And verse 7 says this, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. 
We are persecuted but not forsaken, struck down and not destroyed. Listen. God wants you to be persistent. What's going to keep you and I in 2015 in a world that will continue to become more wicked? Listen, can I news flash just for a moment? Brother Cody, would you mind coming to... I don't know if you have your acoustic this morning, do you? Maybe no. When I come and speak, have your acoustics on. <laughs> Can I just newsflash for a moment? America's not going to get any better. I'm sorry. Can you win your family? Absolutely. Can you win your community? Community? Absolutely. But I don't think that America's going to get any better. The reason why I say that is because I, when I look at that, I, I, I compare that with my Bible. And I see a lot of prophecies that's fulfilling. And I see that the coming of the Lord is very, very near. So I don't think America is going to get any better. But there is hope for your family. There's hope for your community. Please understand that. I want you to look at this as Noah's kind of faith. What's going to help us in 2015? As the coming of the Lord draws nigh, what's going to keep us, what's going to enable us to stay true to God? That when God looks down on the earth, He's pleased with us, and He says right there, that kid right there, that young man, that young woman, that elder, I'm pleased with him because He's denied the ungodly things, He's denied the worldly lusts, and He is righteous, He is holy because I'm righteous and I'm holy. And that is that you and I will obtain the Noah's kind of faith, the faith that is obedient, the faith that is teachable, and the faith that is persistent. Oh, God help us. God help us to have our faith grow each day. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Building up your faith, your utmost faith, speaking in the Holy Ghost. And I want my faith to grow every day. It's only going to grow if I get into this. To be honest, it's only going to grow when you're obedient, when you're teachable, and you stay persistent to what God is saying to you. James said it like this. James says, he simply says this. When you look at James, he said, faith without works is dead. And he goes on to say, listen, I'll show you my faith by my works. What is he trying to He said, faith without works is dead. And then he goes on to say, I'll show you my faith by my word. Can I be honest with you this morning? When you're obedient to God, it speaks for yourself. People see your faith because you're obedient to God. God's, listen, people, your family, your community, as a church, as individuals, your faith will be seen when you step out in obedience to God. Your faith will be seen when you step out and you're teachable. When you let God teach you, I'll never forget. I was just approached, and I apologize. I don't know her name. All I know her is the bus driver for your church. Hi. She came up to me and she said, man, one of our kids, and I won't mention her name. She said, one of our kids went to church camp. She came back, and there's, there's something different about her. Am I right? Is that what you said? There's something different. <coughs> Good different, not bad. I don't know what you did to her. <laughs> something different. She's glowing. She's glowing. She has joy. There's something different about, listen, all of a sudden, there's signs to be seen because now her faith has been placed in God. Her faith is being obedient. Her faith is being teachable. And guess what? You're going to see it. Listen, James says faith without works, men, meaning perhaps faith without obedience is dead. Faith without being teachable is dead. Faith without being persistent is dead. Listen, I'll show you my faith. I'll show you my faith because I'll be obedient to God. I'll show you my faith because I will let God teach me. And I will learn. It may take a couple of times, but I will learn. Listen, it takes about three times and I'll catch on. All right? But I'll learn. I'll be teachable. And then I'll let you see my faith because I'm persistent. You've seen that, right? People in your church that's going through physical ailments, but they serve God and they praise God and you go, wow, what faith they have. 
You watch people in your side of your church that's going through hell. And you're like, wow, look at their faith. Because their faith is speaking for them. Their obedience is speaking for them. Their teachable spirit is, teach, is speaking for them. Their persistence is speaking for them. Would you stand this morning?